What is going on, Diesel Nation? We are really excited to have you guys with us today. We've got something really big to tell you. So for a while now, we've been working on a Discord app, Discord server for the Diesel Podcast. It's basically, if you're not familiar with Discord, it's it's almost like a forum um, as far as the different you know sections and, and, and ways that you can navigate it, but it's our own. So we're, we're launching that today. We're going to have that as a link in the description to the podcast. So you can just click over if you have any smartphone you can join and there's a lot of really cool information a lot of really cool things that are on there so you can customize your profile you can talk about your truck technical information builds things like that we also have exclusive discount codes so if you're looking to save some money on truck parts or even other things we're we're going to be consistently adding new new partners new discounts for lots of really cool stuff basically like man stuff things that you like as a truck person like you're going to use it and uh, it's going to be really fun. And you can you can talk with us on there. I'll be on there. We're going to have sponsors. Um, you know, other or former guests are going to be on. So there's so many questions, so many things. We really wanted to bring everything together into one place for all of our fans to be able to interact with us. So instead of, you know, maybe having to do it on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook or email or things like that, we can all get together, have a great time, talk about trucks, save some money and be able to learn about builds and technical information and, and things like that. Now, also with that is over the years, you guys have asked for a lot of really cool things, things that we've never forgotten about. We always wanted to one day do. And, you know, sometimes it's, hey, can I listen to episodes early? Or, hey, I'd really like to hear a, a, a topic specifically about, you know, say something I'm facing in business or something, you know, with my truck. And so we've started a Patreon. And why that's important is we're not owned by a media company. We don't own a diesel business and make our money with that and then do this on the side. We do the podcast full time and we're able to do that because of you guys. And I've had some of you say, Hey, is there a way I can support the podcast or, Hey, I'd like to, you know, get some decals or some merch or some different things just to support you guys show that I love the podcast. I love listening to the guests that you have on. So we're going to have that as a, as a, a link in the description as well. And you unlock some really cool things. So one of the questions I've heard is, Hey, how do I get my truck on the cover? Well, we're going to have contests for that monthly ones where you'll have a chance to have your truck as the truck that's on our podcast cover. You'll be able to hear episodes early. You'll also get an exclusive episode that we're not going to release on podcast apps or YouTube or anything like that. It's just going to be for Patreon. And there's so many other things that you'll be able to do. So wanted to make these two major announcements. We're super excited about it. I can't wait to be chatting with you guys, seeing your truck pictures, your videos, helping you out if I can, and just being able to see what Diesel Nation is doing out there. On today's podcast, I'm going to be chatting with Ryan Jolinas from r, r Brand Management. And I had gotten an email not long ago from a gentleman who's a heavy duty diesel mechanic. And he said, Hey, I, I have the passion for, for diesel. I, I love it. I listen to your podcast all the time, but I haven't heard you do an episode that says, how do I roadmap my first year in business? And Ryan's built several businesses himself. And it's what he does with his company is he works with businesses that just start all the way up to ones that have been around for 20, 30 years and helping them grow and meet their goals. So we're going to roadmap the first year in business. I thought it was extremely important because, you know, if we're going to offer tips and, and advice on how to do that, I want to chat with somebody who's built a business. It'd be, you know, a, a lot of things that I hear out there or see it, it's sometimes advice from people who I know haven't done it. And it's like, why would I ask somebody how to balance a turbo if they've never balanced a turbo? Or how would I ask them to, how to build an engine when they've never built an engine? So I wanted to have someone on who's done that, can give us some, uh, some concrete tips, a roadmap to be able to do this to help not just this person, but also others of you out there that have the same question. All right, let's get to the podcast with Ryan and roadmapping the first year of being a diesel shop owner. Ryan Jolinas, welcome back to the Diesel Podcast. It's been a minute or two since we chatted last, and I know, well, you were just out at UCC, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's good to be back on. Uh, thanks for in, in, inviting me on here. I still think this is one of the best places to come for uh, information about the industry, uh, manufacturers, events, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you guys do a really good job of, uh, of uh, pushing a lot of relevant content um, on the podcast and uh, hats off to you for sure. Um, but yeah, UCC was a big success. Uh, we didn't freeze to death. Uh, we weren't standing in 40 feet of water and uh, uh, it was probably the best weather we've ever had for UCC. 
Um, <clears throat> turnout was great. Like, um, you know, day one, uh, there was only one truck who didn't record a time. And I think that kind of, uh, alludes to how much better we've gotten with, uh, aftermarket technology on, at the horsepower levels we're able to, to reach, you know, obviously power driven had that catastrophic failure. Um, but I mean, they, they are known for beating <laughs> the crap out of their rigs uh, at, the, at the ATS um, gauntlet challenge. They sheared all their torque converter bolts off trying to go for 3,000 horsepower. So those guys just straight send it. Um, but, um, but like I said, I mean, for the spectators, um, there was just a lot to do. They ran the ODR, which Firepunk and their crew did a really good job of uh, organizing and putting that on as kind of a, you know, uh, side by side event so like it like you know day two if you're a spectator and um you were there just to watch trucks dyno you know everybody took every bit of their 20 minutes for you know how long do you really rev up on on the dyno you know maybe 10 seconds that type of thing uh so in between that they had all the the pro classes and the bracket racing so for somebody who wanted to come to a ucc that was that was a, a really smart thing to do there where you know you just had non-stop action you had uh lots of fast rigs going down the uh the track and you had you know dinos in between it and then a really good day of racing the day before so i think it was uh well worth the money for all the folks that showed up and and one of the things i did notice is you know, who I spoke to in Vendor Alley was mostly uh, shop owners. A lot of guys flew in, uh, talked to manufacturers, distributors, um, you know, uh, see other peers in the industry they hadn't seen for a long time. It turns into actually a pretty good networking event if you're in the, the diesel industry. So it's a, it's a can't miss if uh, you are into diesel racing. And it's definitely a can't miss if you're in the industry and want to see what's going on with um, everything from, um, you know, part supply right now all the way down to EPA enforcement and things like that. It's just a really good area where all the mines get together and kind of share their experiences. That really leads into today's topic. And I want to explain where this came from, because this this has been brewing in my mind for quite a while. And, you know, you get in those YouTube loops and you're watching, you know, some documentary on something and then watching a <laughs> truck video on something else. And, and I was listening um, to somebody talk about uh, being an entrepreneur or something. And they were giving all these tips and I'd actually seen this person somewhere, um, somewhere else. But I thought, well, have they actually done this? Have they actually, you know, what he's telling, you know, somebody to do as an investor, real estate person, whatever, has it, has he actually done it? And I started to think, well, what about in diesel? And, um, you know, are there any, are there any go-to like episodes or places to get content where some of this stuff is outlined and I couldn't really find it. And I, I, you know, could talk or, or find things of people talking about doing it, but had they actually done it, I, I don't know. And that thought just sparked my head, like, you know, it'd be like somebody telling me how to balance a turbo when they've never balanced a turbo or right. telling me how to build an engine if they never built an engine. And, you know, I kind of just let the idea sit for a little bit. And then about a week ago, I got an email from a guy and he said, I've been listening to the podcast for a really long time. I'm a heavy duty diesel mechanic. And I know what I want to do is I want to open my own shop. Now, I don't know if he wants to do repair, maintenance, a little performance, no performance. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But he said, you know, I've listened to some of your episodes. You're talking about the passion of it. You're talking about, you know, how to get uh, accounts with a WD or online marketing. But what about a roadmap for the first year? And I've never done one like that. I've never found or heard or seen or anything anyone ever do that. And I thought of you immediately because, one, I know you've, you've built businesses yourself. But then also with R&R brand management, that's what you do. You work with a wide array of shops, whether they're just starting out or they've been around for 30 years. And so I thought we'd chat today and just kind of roadmap what would be either things you've seen people do or, you know, they've told you or you've done yourself as far as roadmapping year one in business. And I think maybe I'm wrong, but I thought the first step would be doing a business plan. And, And before you ever get a license or ever do anything else, is actually identifying what it is you want to do, what your core market is. Are you going to work on one brand of truck, all three trucks? Are you going to do maintenance? Are you going to do accessories? Are you, you know, what what exactly are you going to do? Sure, sure. Well, I think this would be universal business advice, <clears throat> whether it's a, a you know a rep firm like mine, 
um, or somebody wanting to say manufacture, you know, let's say somebody came up with for, you know, easy uh, words like you know, a new sump design or something like that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> a repair um, performance shop is no different. Um, when you typically, when you sit down and write a business plan, it's in the hopes of pitching said business plan to uh, SBA or a local, um, you know, financial institution for um, a small business loan, um, and that would probably be the first thing tell you to do is that a, a business plan is going to consist at least of your first five years of how you're going to fund it, um, what your revenue looks like, where you put the shop is important. Just because mom gives you the shed out back doesn't mean you're necessarily putting your shop in a uh, population density and that's going to be you know, advantageous for your market. I'm yeah. not saying you have to put it in downtown LA, you know, um, but if you put it at the family farm where it's really hard to access, put billboards up, um, any of those types of things, you know, that may not be the way to go. However, what I will tell you is in that first year of the five years, most of the uh, quote shop owners, that's exactly how they start. And they, I don't know if they necessarily consider themselves in business until they have a standalone um, facility with, um, you know, normal business hours. Uh, but a lot of the guys that I've met in their first year are working out of their own garage, um, are working part time, um, you know, have a, a normal day job, and then they slowly transition it over into a, um, a long term deal. So I guess the best thing for this podcast would be talk to talk to the guys that are maybe doing it on the side right now, um, and and would like to get to that next level. They would like to make it a full time job opportunity. Um, and the first thing I would say is, you know, check what your motivation is for sure. You know, is it ego? Do you hate your boss? Uh, do you think that there is more money in owning your own thing, or do you think you have a talent and a, de a desire and drive for entrepreneurship? Because if you don't. Um, then you will fail 110%. If you are meant to work for another dude and that guy take all the risk for you and pay you your health insurance and take the taxes out of your checks, then go work for a dude. Like if you've got a passion for trucks, let somebody take care of you. I mean, there's plenty of really well-established shops out there, diesel shops that, you know, the, the lifestyle around and the owner is great. You know, you take RLC Motorsports, for example, he brings his whole crew out to the track, they go racing together. They're a family, they go to lunches and dinners together, they celebrate birthdays together. That's a great life. Um, but if that's not you, um, if you really do have um, a desire to create, um, to have something on your own, then yeah, I would very much encourage you to um, get online and simply Google five-year business plan. I remember at one point I wanted to open a brew pub and it was a big eye-opener when I saw what types of demographics as far as population densities, average incomes that it would take for me to get an SBA loan because I needed a lot of equipment, um, you know, brewing equipment, kitchen equipment, staff, that type of thing. All that has to go into a business plan. Um, and again, you really have to fund it for five years. You have to assume that company is going to break even or take a loss for five years. So if you don't fund it for five years, you're going to be cash poor and that's going to be really hard for you to say overcome a competitor. Now, if you open up a shop in East Jesus and there is no competition and you're basically just doing trucks for buddies and, and slowly building and that type of thing, again, that's just kind of a different side of it. But you're, if you're you know, interested in being aggressive and starting a business that scales quickly and turns into, you know, something that you can leave behind to your kids and, you know, so on and so forth, that's built to last, that's something that's important. And that would probably lead me to my next thing educate yourself, read, like you get an audible account for God's sakes, read built to last, read millionaire service advisor, like read anything by Robert Greene, any nonfiction business book you can get your hands on talking about entrepreneurship, talking about personal finance and business finance, just read, like it will get your juices flowing. Um, don't spend your evenings uh, one of the things in the seven habits for highly successful people, the very the seventh habit is called sharpen the saw and reading is kind of one of those things. If you're busier than you can keep up with, 
in your first year and you're just killing yourself, you know, working till one in the morning and you're not taking time to read, spend time with your family, um, get into your QuickBooks and get everything balanced, um, you're, you're going to end up with a mess and you're going to end up with a mess that you're, it's either going to take you out or you're going to have to pay somebody a lot of money to untangle that mess. So staying organized, sharp, measured, disciplined is, is just, that's the most important things for your first year. Um, it's just making sure that you've got your finances um, in, in order, that you're educated, you've got a business plan um, in place. There's, there are too many resources online via YouTube or via, um, like I said, like Audible, reading books and things like that um, for anybody to be uneducated on anything. YouTube at some point, I feel like might just replace tech schools and, uh, and colleges for, you know, basic four-year degrees with the amount of content that's out there and lectures you can listen to and, and information that's, that's free. It's $0. You know what yeah. I mean? Like if I had all that crap when I, while I was starting out, I would have loved to get my hands on it. Um, but again, that takes taking ego out of it. If the, if your motivation to go from this day job of twisting wrenches to I'm going to open my own deal is because you hate the guy you work for, then just go find another job with a guy you do like. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a really important part of it because, and I think that's why this idea popped in my head and I was really passionate about it is this is one of the hardest things anyone will ever do in their life. And you had mentioned, you know, that five-year plan and either break it even or, or losing a little money and, you know, things like that is that, that amount of stress can't be understated. And if you're not completely dedicated to it, then it's going to be like most businesses that I don't know what most of them last a year or two. Right. Um, right. It's a vast majority of them. And so I think identifying that is, is, is really important in, you know, why are you doing this? And, it, you know, if we assume, okay, like you said, you got the passion for it. Well, then you really need to educate yourself. And I think part of that education can also be talking with people who may not be in the diesel industry per se, or the automotive industry, but even other industries, there's a lot of universal lessons. Most of them are actually universal. There, there's no, you know, specific um, kind of thing that, that tells you how to, you know, start it or grow it or impact people or have good customer service or manage your funds or those sort of things that are just entirely specific to one industry. And so I think networking, you know, you'd mentioned UCC and going there and, talking with people or really any sort of place people um, that are in this or close to it exist would be a, a great group of people to network with and ask them, um, you know, hey, what were your mistakes? What would you do different? Um, you know, would you have bought all that equipment up front or would you have spread it out a little bit? And, and that can save a lot of time and headaches. Yeah, I mean, um, people's experience, especially if they're passionate about it, um, usually that advice is free. Um, you know, basically what you're trying to learn to do in your first year is take what you know how to do and monetize it in the most efficient way possible. So if the time spent is best for you to be in, you know, under the hood of a truck, then mm -hmm. that's important, right? If time spent is more important for you to be handling more of the business management side of it and assemble a good team, that would be part of it. And again, I believe that's going to be um, very much dependent on the size of business you want to start, the team you're able to assemble in the first year. Is it just you? Is it you and your buddy? Is it you and your wife and your mom and your buddy? Um, you know, it, it, it all kind of, you know, can, it, I've just seen so many different colors of it. Like, I'm going to say something really unpopular right now. I don't think your wife should work for you. <laughs> like, like I, I see it all the time. Sometimes it works great. I've seen a lot of husband and wife teams in their business do wonderful. Um, in fact, my wife helps me in my business with the books, like very much part time. Like she doesn't work a nine to five or anything for R and R, go on the road or do booths or anything like that. But um, I have, however, seen the most catastrophic failures <laughs> of relationships. Um, is, is having your wife in there. I was talking to a good buddy who has a shop in PA and he called me. Um, this has been some years back. He, and I was like, Hey, how's it going? And he goes, Oh, pretty good. I fired my wife today. I'm like, what? I'm like, no joke. I brought her in like an HR meeting. I sat her down. I dismissed her. I gave her an exit interview, told her to get her stuff and leave. And, uh, it, and it, yeah. Right. I'm sure dinner was awkward after that. Um, 
if I mean, a lot of family members and friends will want to step up and help you. The more autonomous you can stay, the better. It, you really do need to have that separate <clears throat> life of uh, kids and wife and baseball and, and so on and so forth. It is just much healthier for you as a person, your relationships and your business in the long run. I absolutely understand why some people have their wives in their business. Some people meet their wives in their business. They started, they hired a secretary, they're both single, they end up getting married. Like I've seen that happen too. Um, so, you know, at that point, they kind of <laughs> it, it didn't intend to have your wife in your business, that type of thing. Um, yeah. But again, that's, uh, that's first year. I mean, like I said, if I was setting up a, a service repair shop, um, I would have my wife involved. Sure. You know, let her know about, obviously you should have good communication and things, but I don't think I would run my wife as an employee um, personally. Uh, but again, I can think of um, dozens of examples of great uh, husband and wife teams. I just don't think it's ideal in my opinion. <laughs> so, so after you, you do this, this research, you come up with the plan, you decide, you know, maybe you do ease into it a little bit and then you get to that point of, okay, I need to turn this full time, um, or I want to, I think the next big thing would be funding. You had mentioned SBA loans and it, it's going to take a certain amount of money to, you know, get the space wherever it is that you choose to do it, mm -hmm. um, expand, with equipment and, and different things like that. What are some th things that you've heard people do um, or, or seen them do to be able to fund that first year? Um, <clears throat> a lot of guys uh, do again, reach out to family. Um, you know, I, I've, I've talked to several people who are like, oh yeah, you know, we built a steel building on my dad's property and, and he helped us fund it. And, you know, he had a job at, you know, <clears throat> a really good job and, and they did it that way and they were able to kind of fund through it. And again, that puts some stress on the family, but if it, you guys are tight and you trust each other, I would still set up documents that protect both, both parties as far as, you know, getting them paid back and, and whether you give them, uh, you know, a small ownership stake in the company. Um, but I think the best way still is the SBA loans, um, particularly now with uh, some of the COVID stuff, um, the, go the government is really kind of opened up the piggy banks on extremely low interest loans, like 2%. And that's going to be more than likely significantly less than any kind of credit card you can run that on. Um, I would avoid getting into too much consumer debt that you aren't just like nailing um, every month. So if you're going to do a credit card, I would maybe suggest doing like a, a cash card, like a, a Amex Platinum or something like that. Some of their concierge services are nice for travel. If you t intend to travel to some of these events and what have you, um, that's, that's going to help you kind of um, make sure that you're not overextending yourself. It gets real easy once they start upping your credit limit on these 19% APR, you know, Capital One cards or whatever, not to crap on Capital One, just picking something out of the out of the ether there. Um, but I mean, I, I certainly seen that where it's just like, oh, you know, we'll just overextend ourselves just a little bit. Um, but some of the nice things too is, is get in good with these WDs. Like if you can pick a WD and create a really good relationship with them over your first year, most of them will either give you say a core account where they defer cores for you. So if in the you know case of injectors or transmissions, you're talking anywhere between a thousand, uh, you know, two thousand, twenty five hundred dollars that is parked you know what I mean like you buy the transmission you can't get that money back until you return that and if anybody's dealt with cores they know that people don't return core money like the day it lands back at that facility and so yeah. I've certainly dealt with a ton of calls where somebody's like hey when are you gonna, am I going to get my core money back and I'm like well it's got to go through processing like hey anyway you can like pump that ahead and I'm thinking to myself, why is this guy's whole business teetering on $2,200 right now? It's underfunded. He's overextended. You know, um, the, the other thing is, you know, do an SBA loan, go through a local bank where you have a relationship with your banker, where you can go sit down with your banker. Your banker can look at your books every month and you take him to dinner, like get to know this guy. Um, he's going to give you this most solid and, you know, financial advice is possible. So steer clear from the credit cards, get a good relationship with your banker, 
go the SBA route. It's going to be a very low interest loan, especially during COVID. Um, and then finally, your accountant. You know, you find a good CPA, another person that you can have a personal relationship that will help you walk through QuickBooks. I used to have an accountant that was located in Florida. We just moved one to one that's here local. It made all the difference in the world with us being able to reconcile our books, stay more organized, because I can go over there with the laptop and sit down and she goes, no idiot, press this button. And you're like, oh yeah, that's what that's <laughs> for. So um, uh, this was also advice from Lenny Reed from Dynamite. I was sitting down last night um, chatting with him. I said, well, what are your like, you know, top five things that uh, you would do? And Lenny's one of those stories with the whole wife thing. So that was one of his first things. He's like, never let your wife into your business <laughs> ever. Uh, his second thing was, was keep ego out of it. He, he, in his first starting of his first year, he built too many sled pull trucks for friends for free because he wanted to get his name out there. He wanted to prove that he was the best and he wasn't focusing on things that made him money, which would have been, you know, head gasket jobs and things that aren't sexy. But if you focus on things that are sexy, that if you focus on, you know, I'm glad I don't work for that guy anymore. Now I can, you know, build a race truck, um, get yourself established and rooted in the industry, get yourself cash positive, get that loan paid off as fast as quickly, you know, uh, live like a peasant because by the time you get all this built up, then, then you can live like a king and live like nobody else lives. And uh, as opposed to kind of limping along. And unfortunately I've seen some businesses that I know have been in business for maybe 10 years, but they still look like they're in their first year and they still have the same pain points of their first year. Um, so they, just getting out of that as quickly as humanly possible um, the valley of shadow of death, like get out quick <laughs> if you can. So get whatever loans that you need to, to get the equipment you need, the lifts. Um, obviously, hopefully you have your own tools and all that going into it. The, the point of sale system, the good computers, um, you know, do the dumb little things too, as far as marketing is concerned. I am blown away how many diesel shops today that I can type, you know, um, Denver, Colorado diesel repair and, maybe half of the shops will show up in the area that I know of because they didn't set up a Google profile. Like <laughs> it's free dollars. Just set up when your hours are, put a photo of the shop out front, look somewhat legitimate, put some signage up. You know, even if you, again, you're in a field somewhere, put the money into a sign. You can take it to your next <laughs> yeah. shop if you move out of there. So just some of those little things that you can see, like put yourself in the shoes of a consumer. Who do I want to give $10,000 to, to work on my truck? Is, is it an organized clean shop? Is it somebody that answers the phone when you call? Is it somebody that I can see on, the, on, on Google that pops up as a very legitimate business? Buy the domain name. It's $20 a year from GoDaddy. You know, have an email that says, you know, John Doe at dieselperformance.com. You know, that th those are the things that I look for as a manufacturer and WDs look for as dealer applicants when we approve you or don't approve you to buy our parts, whether it be, you, you know, and, and what level we bring you in at and what kind of marketing assets we decide to send you, whether it be banners, you know, showroom displays, things like that. A lot of that stuff's free, but you need to do the groundwork that it makes, that it takes for you to look professional, to, to instill consumer confidence, but also confidence in, in manufacturers that, that want to do business with you. I mean, this is obviously aside from getting, you know, a tax ID number and a reseller's permit, you know, per your state's you know, requirements. And that, again, is why a good accountant is important to find. She slash he can set all that up for you. You don't have to have, you don't have to be a CPA to um, run your business like one. Um, you can, you just need to develop a good relationship. You know, let them be the experts in that. You go be an expert and fixing trucks um, or making them faster, um, you know, and, uh, and something you had mentioned too, it's kind of like picking a lane um, of what you're gonna do in year one. You know, do you wanna sell accessories? Do you wanna have an online e-commerce business? Um, you know, what does that look like? Can you go against the big dogs of the world that spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in SEO, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, click ads and, and then have all this, a whole team of guys that are working on SEO and then working out of, you know, really high-end custom websites. Um, maybe if you do want to do e-commerce, third parties for you, you know, maybe you're an Amazon or eBay was what manufacturers are, 
are uh, you know friendly to that? What WDs are friendly to drop ships? What are those uh, fees look like? Um, and kind of putting all that together. Same thing with merchant services. All these things need to be considered as far as your costs are concerned when you write that business plan and you go in and get funded. Um, so all of the business administrative costs you need to gather together on top of your building, your electric and consumables, lifts, tools, um, and then you know, are you going to have employees? You know, uh, just kind of figuring out and penciling out a roadmap of what those costs looks like, and then and then going to the SBA and say not I need $50,000, maybe you need $350,000 to really make this thing work, you know, when in year one, um, provided you make no money or provided you lost $20,000 that year just because of reinvesting in the business. So just don't be underfunded. Um, stay away from high leverage debt um, and get really good financial people behind you. That's for me, that's step one. Um, it's just making sure the business side of it's taken care of because you wouldn't be doing this if you didn't know how to uh, swap a transmission or fix a head gasket. What were some of the other things that Lenny said for for advice? I think you was it two or three things that, that he told you there that you just mentioned. Yeah, it was the ego. <clears throat> it was it was you know the the banker was a big thing for him, um, getting his money straight. Um, I'm trying to think of what else he said. It's Lenny. We tangent a lot when we're talking. We're like, ah, let me tell you about this one guy. You know, it, one, one story he told me, and this was in a different time, was um, well, this is when Lenny was twisting wrenches, and it was somebody that um, was like local and kind of a hero to him. And he goes, Lenny, um, if somebody comes in and says, you know, this isn't working on my truck, can you look at it? And you pull it in, and you're like, you got some time. You're like, sure, sure, I can look at it. And uh, you pull it in, look at it, it's a blown fuse. Um, swap the fuse, pull back out, and send the guy on his way. He goes, why? He's like, I should get paid for my knowledge and experience in fixing it. He goes, no, that guy's going to come back for every oil change, every head gasket, every AC fix, every everything. And uh, Lenny's tried to run himself that way. I know people that would vehemently disagree with that, um, of just, hey, swap the fuse, don't charge the guy, kick him down the road. Um, but I thought that was kind of a nice story. Um, but one of the other advice, pieces of advice he, he gave me, and I took it, is, uh, is read the Les Schwab book about how Les Schwab started, started Les Schwab and the type of work ethic that he instills into his employees. He kind of, uh, kind of writes it as like a stream of consciousness thing. So it's almost like a podcast, like the guy writes like he talks, um, but he's built one of the most successful tire wheel accessory uh, businesses in the Pacific Northwest. So like I said, there's some great resources out there, but that was one of his uh, bits of advice is uh, that book helped helped him a lot uh, as far as organizing employee retention because I think today everybody's realizing how important employee retention is today and that's something to always remember whether you're year one or year 10 is um, obviously weeding out cancerous employees that are, are toxic for your other ones is important um, but making sure that you've created a work environment that doesn't have ego in it again, like, um, but that is, uh, people want to stay, you know, you know, pay them well, take care of the benefits, um, you know, keep your ego and temper in check, uh, remember their birthdays, like take them to lunch, <laughs> you know, all these types of things that, you know, build a really conducive work environment and they will work harder, they will be happier and you'll keep them longer. But, <clears throat> you know, right now with, some of the furloughs and COVID and unemployment being as, as uh, profitable as it is. And this, this podcast may not age well, just because I'm sure all that stuff will be hopefully behind us in the next oh, year. Hopefully. But, hopefully. but um, they'll be like, what the heck is he talking about? <laughs> oh, this is in 2021. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, nobody wants to work. So can you, can you imagine, you know, the guy that you fired for, you know, sweeping floors or whatever, begging him to come back for 18 or $20 an hour when you used to pay him nine um, because you just can't find anybody. Uh, so that's, that's something that I would really encourage is that, um, you know, you, you, it's the golden rule, treat others how you want to be treated. So it's, it's putting yourself in the shoes of your employees, but also putting yourself in the shoes of your consumers. So again, it's how does a business look like to the outside world? 
How do you treat your customers? Um, you know, fix the fuse, um, get the Google page put up, um, and, and don't be a dick to your employees, pardon the language. Well, I think, yeah, and, and I was thinking about, okay, you know, you put together the business plan, you get the SBA loan, um, you do the online presence, mm -hmm. things that should be done, and you start getting customers. And yep. then I, I've, I haven't experienced this, it's just things I've read or conversations I've had with people that uh, have shops is a key person quits or a key person says, Hey, I'm going to go work somewhere else. And you have that hit that first year. Hmm. It's going to everything. A lot's going to fall by the wayside because you're going to panic one. Cause you got to get these trucks out. got to answer these calls, return calls, file your business tax stuff, do your sales tax things, all this stuff's going on. And I think the environment is really important in thinking about, okay, if I'm going to have, um, you know, a, a, a helper or another mechanic, how am I going to keep them happy? How am I going to challenge them? And I had read something recently, people were talking about that and saying, you know, sometimes it's not all about the money. Sometimes it's about the environment. That's why these guys stay. And yeah. so just retaining that help, especially, especially now and you know, probably for a while it's going to be like this is where do you find the good help? I think that's a common theme I've always yeah, heard for 10 years is where do you find the good help? <laughs> Uh, Eric Merchant one time told me, he goes, I don't hire people based on experience. If I did, you know, I'd, I'd be in pretty, pretty rough shape. I hire people who are humble and that are curious. Um, I know a lot of people, their best employee started part time just because he liked trucks, um, was willing to get a little bit of pay. But what he really wanted to do was go to the shows with the shop owner, have a place to work on his own vehicle, maybe. Um, you know, he, he was passionate for the deal, but he, you know, again, it's that, uh, you know, pride and ego is the one, one kind of killer. If you can find somebody who doesn't know everything um, and you have the wherewithal and the ability to mentor them um, <clears throat> and, and you treat them well enough, they'll either stick with you forever and be your right-hand man uh, and you'll retire together and do well. Um, or you'll treat him, uh, you know, you'll train him enough to where he ends up opening up a shop next door to you <laughs> and being your competition. But, um, you know, getting them where they're young um, it seems to be one of the best best ways I've seen out there. So most year one shops, it's the owner um, working on the trucks, um, mostly just just himself. And then he has somebody comes in that's in high school or is going to the tech school or something like that at three o'clock and works till six or seven as a, as a part-time job um that that seems to be a great way for those guys to get some on the job experience for whatever they want to do go work for cummins and you know i see good techs leave well-established shops all the time just because some of the big guys um their benefit packages and what they pay and what the actual workload is is really attractive and, and some of these um independent uh repair facilities just can't offer the same stuff yeah. Um, you know, I talked to a guy out in Knoxville, Tennessee, had just lost one of his very good techs to, I think it was Cummins or something like that. You know, sometimes you're just not going to be able to retain that employee. Um, but you know, having, having a never ending supply of like mediocre middle, um, techs that get the job done right. Um, that don't really ruffle too many feathers, but they're not total rock stars. Um, that'd be, that'd be great. If you could have an endless supply of that, that'd be fantastic. You don't need to chase the hot chick. You can definitely chase like, uh, you know, she's a six, that type of thing. And she's not going to cheat on you. <laughs> so if you get, if you get enough of those lined up, um, you'll have a pretty rock steady crew. Um, it's just what that business ends up evolving into, I think ends up being the hard part. If you did all the other stuff we already talked about and you're the right guy, year one is going to be difficult but you'll push through all these problems and still give good customer service. Um, I think it's just making sure in year one, you know, there's going to be a year seven and 10 and 15 and so on and so forth and, and building those little things around you. And again, I think your staff ends up being probably your most valuable asset um, to you at the end of the day. But again, treat your banker and your CPA like staff. You, you're paying them a fee to do work for you. You're the customer. So it's a, it's the same thing as, as an employee, you're paying them a wage to, to do some work for you. So anybody in the, in that space, um, again, what's the, what's the relationship like? What's the environment like? If you're really nice to your accountant and your banker, because 
you know, they have their own business and you feel like that's etiquette, but you're an a-hole to your employees. Why? Why is there a dichotomy there? Um, you know, you got to treat them just as well as you would treat a customer that walks in the front door, because at that point you work for them. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it was a Henry Ford who, you know, said that, uh, um, you know, he's not the employer, the customer is, and to treat them as such. Uh, you know, with respect, dignity, all that good stuff. So, um, but yeah, I mean, if, like I said, if you're the right, uh, you've got the right temperament for it, uh, you're gutsy and you're, and you end up being um, smart, you know, and again, pull ego and pride out of it and you're humble and ask questions. One of my favorite examples in this industry is Chris and Paul Rutledge uh, out of Jasper, Texas. A little shout out to the CP Addicts guys. Man, they started as complete performance in Jasper, Texas. Again, one of those we worked as brothers out of our shop. Um, they, uh, they slowly grew it into a nice facility and they really just put themselves out there. I remember they bought this big semi that was a stage trailer and took a TS one year. And I'm like, how have I never heard of these people? Like who can afford this big old three, it was a really cool 369 Pete and it was lime green and black is about as loud of a vehicle as you'd ever see. And they had everybody over there buying parts and shirts and, and all this stuff and hats from them. And they were having a good time. And but I would tell you this, you know, when they went on the, um, we have like a wholesaler that does a, a dealer event, but when they attended that, uh, and I got to meet with them, you know, outside of a show and drinking beer and having fun, that type of thing, they wanted to know everything. They always had questions and, and it was, it was everything. What, you know, what level of QuickBooks you're using? What are you doing with this? Like they just, again, they had no pride. They didn't think that they knew everything. They knew they didn't. <laughs> and so all they did was ask questions and they've been able to transition their business from twist and wrenches um, and trying to get trucks out to flipping OBS trucks and being the largest OBS um, OE part supplier in the country with the CP Addicts. And uh, I mean, hats off to them for being able to take their business from working in, in a garage, marketing themselves, asking questions, being curious, being humble, to uh, being able to be the authority in a certain space of our industry. And again, that, that can also lead to another good question uh, that you asked earlier, what, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to repair performance? What does that look like? So having having a really good idea of what your self identity and what you want to chase is important. Do you just want to work on Duramaxes? Well, what does that demographic look like around you? Cause if there's yeah. 10 Duramax trucks around you, your business is going to fail. <laughs> you yeah. know, there's lots of guys who just work on Fords, you know um, there's guys who work on Fords and they reman injectors um, for Fords because you know, those parts are out there. Is that something you want to do? Do you want to, do you want to add common rail testing and buy a little Bosch stand to uh, do injector testing at your shop? You know, there's all these great questions you can answer and you can build into a business plan and you can fund on the front end and, and have kind of your cake and eat it too. If you do all the right steps before, uh, before your first year starts. So, you know, if you can get a little money underneath you, um, uh, doing it on the side before you go full time, that's great. Um, but I don't think you're going to get the kind of cash behind you that you need outside of, again, leveraging yourself into terrible consumer debt or second mortgages or anything like that. I think that in my opinion, particularly right now, the SBA is the way to go. I will tell you this, the SBA is a no joke, pay me back sucker organization. Like there is no forgiveness there. Like you pay your loan on time. <laughs> Otherwise somebody that, you know, comes and breaks your kneecaps type of thing. It's, it's way less gentle than just going through a regular, um, you can get a small business loan through like US bank and things like that, but the rates aren't near as good and, and their requirements are probably going to be a little bit more stringent. But if you, again, if you've got a banker that you've got a great relationship with and they've got something attractive, you know, ask, you know, I, what, what I know may differ from some things that you have access to or relationships you have um, in your own, in own community. So use those. Don't be afraid to, again, ask questions, put yourself out there, you know, be wrong, get embarrassed, you know, screw up all those, because all these things are just learning experiences and, and you'll be better for it. Um, you know, and just don't get down on yourself, you know, just keep your head up and keep going. I think that definitely that email that, uh, that we received 
that definitely lays out that that first year with some tips and and you know i think some of the concepts too also are going to bleed over into the other years you know with the retention and the marketing and and all that sort of stuff but at least at least that you know with the people that that you chatted with in your own experience sharing it and and some of these concepts of planning it out i think is really key because a lot of times i think someone's their passion is like hey i want to go do this and they jump in and do it and then they get in over their head and it uh it, it it's just stressful and so and owning your own business is the scariest thing you'll ever do 110 percent. i mean maybe save from like putting another human into this world but uh it's it's yeah it's daunting like, it, like just don't get don't get down on yourself don't don't stress it out again it's that sharpen the saw thing don't work yourself to death don't ignore your family and friends you know you still make time for all those things um the work's not going anywhere you know uh, if you bust out one more truck but you are you know just horribly depressed you know, you think about the, the profit margin, maybe in getting one more truck done versus, you know, reading a book or taking your wife to dinner and, and having that much less stress. Uh, I know plenty of people that, you know, let's just say on that truck, you netted a thousand bucks would pay well more than a thousand dollars to say, Hey, if I gave you this pill, your stress goes away. Yeah. Um, so, you know, stress management, um, managing, you know, depression, anxiety, all those things are important. Like your mental health is important. You know, I have a good, um, his manufacturer, uh, up in Canada, he actually pays for his employees, <clears throat> um, mental health care. Like he offers as part of their medical packet, um, a certain amount of like an, of like an hour, hour and a half of therapy. So like three 30 minute sessions a month, if, if you want it, you don't have to use it. He uses it. It helped him. He reads a lot. We, we share books and things like that. His employee retention is insane. He's like, I, he's like, Ryan, I haven't, when I instituted this, I didn't know. I read about it. I went ahead and did it, spent the money on it. And, um, I don't have, not only have I not lost any employees since I instituted this, you know, a year ago, but, uh, I haven't had a late employee in a year. I was like, you're kidding me. He was like, nope on time doing their thing everybody uses it it's like i just basically came out of my shell and said listen guys i use it it's available to you if you want it so if the leader uses it eh, maybe the followers will be like eh, maybe he's onto something matt's a pretty successful guy um so like all those things are important like i said i'm not saying you got to go sit on a couch but every small town has counselors i mean even if it's like your pastor or something like that um you know uh, having an outside person's opinion is important. And again, that's one of those things about these networking events. It's very therapeutic. You get to kind of bitch and moan about customers. And, you know, we have that uh, diesel shop owners forum on Facebook and, you know, all that stuff's therapeutic, getting it off your chest and, and being able to, again, sharpen the saw, reset, you know, because at some point that'll come out somewhere if, if you don't, if you don't manage it and handle it because entrepreneurship sucks. I mean, it's worth it. It's one of those things. If it was easy, everybody would do it type of thing. Um, but you have to be smart, educated, um, talented, stubborn. Uh, but you also need to, you know, help kind of, you know, manage and budget all those stresses. And that takes a rock star of a person. So if you're not that guy, you're going to fail. Sorry. <laughs> or you're going to have a really mediocre business that you're not super happy with. And whenever you're six feet under, so is that business. Um, so if you really want to build something to last, again, there's a whole book called Built to Last. You can read, <laughs> you know, look, look into some of those things. And it touches on, you know, keeping your business efficient. Um, some of the things that we talked about on the financial side of things and, and funding it properly. And it gives lots of examples of larger companies that have been able to build things to last, like, you know, Chrysler and, and what have you. Um, not saying that, you know, you can't build what you're doing into a chain. You know, I, I know some diesel repair shops that have four five and six stores. So, you know, don't, uh, don't sell yourself short on what your potential is. Again, if you're that guy, you know, definitely do the big deep dive self-examination thing before you uh, jump off the, the cliff. Um, but, you know, if you just want to have a little side hustle and make some side money, and you have a good relationship with the guy you are working for, and there's no conflict between those, maybe that's, maybe that's all you need to do, you know, but if you really want to go for it, 
good luck. <laughs> I'll come, hopefully I'll come visit you sometime and uh, <laughs> hand you some banners and shake your hand and, and, uh, and you can tell me about how your first year is gone and, and uh, I'll see you on some of these dealer incentive events and, and what have you. I mean, we're all pulling for you. I, I can tell you this, there's plenty of work out there. There is not one shop that I'm walking up to right now that isn't six, eight weeks behind and has, you know, 40 to 100 trucks sitting in their lot right now. Um, just because they can't get it done. There aren't enough techs. There's, there aren't enough people going to school for it. There aren't enough trainable people because I don't know, parents don't spank their kids anymore or whatever it is. Like you just can't find people that are worth hiring. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the opportunity's there. Demand is there. I'll tell you that much. So uh, it's, it's a good field to get into. Um, I was talking to a guy who does 7.3 injectors. This give you kind of a scale of how big the industry is. They made like 2.3 million um, 7.3 road trucks. So this is, this is an even um, uh, stationary engines, like generators and what have you. Um, he, he does a little 7.3 injector program. He's selling 700 sets of 7.3 injectors a month. 700 a month and that's just injector jobs and that's just a 7.3 like we're talking a million years ago they made 5.3 million six liters those things are everywhere you know yeah. and, and they're still making the six seven cummins um you know they they are still making the 68 rfe which is the worst transmission ever and it started in 07 and a half so you know there are millions upon millions of these vehicles that need serviced upgraded repaired everything and there aren't enough people to do it so yeah if you are so inspired to do the work get educated and get funded build the relationships um then uh they're they're the sky's the limit there's a lot of money out there to be made um and uh i mean customers hate here and yeah we can fix your truck but i can't get to it for eight weeks you know that's true well that, that's a lot of good advice right i always enjoy these chats with you and and uh, being able to answer these questions for people with a lot of this, you know, like how to start a diesel shop. I never started a diesel shop. I don't, I didn't buy the scan tools and the lifts and all right. that sort of stuff. So, you know, to get these questions answered, yeah, you know, I've got to do one of the things you mentioned, which is network and talk to other people. And you walk into these shops and deal with them all year and, and help them grow and do the things that they're doing. So I appreciate those insights and I mean, the future will do a, year two to three or two to four because yeah. <laughs> there's a whole <laughs> bunch of other things right. that factor into you this made it through one year you have one employee and you got a little money in the bank well, yeah then how, <laughs> how do you next? grow it yeah, yeah how do you grow exactly it? what's next exactly. um yeah no for sure i mean you start talking more about marketing and and things like that i'd love to come on for a follow-up and uh look forward to any uh any questions and uh i mean if you guys want to reach out to me or my business partner, uh, have any questions. Uh, I'm Ryan G at R and R brand And, uh, Ryan Husted is, uh, Ryan H at R and R brand And, you know, R Ryan has now started three separate wheel companies, um, you know, with his business partners and has contacts and manufacturing and all these types of things. So he's a great resource for, um, you know, kind of how to structure that type of a company, you know, packaging, all that, all that kind of stuff. So no matter what you want to do in the performance aftermarket, diesel aftermarket, you know, you name it, it's hot right now. I mean, we can't keep up with parts. We can't keep up with customers. We can't keep up with demand. So if you were on the fence and this podcast didn't scare you away, do it. Awesome, man. Well, again, I appreciate your time today chatting with me and dropping some knowledge as, as usual. And I'm, I'm sure I'll uh, be chatting with you here soon, see some uh, more event coverage and some things you guys are working on. So again, I thank you for your time today. For sure, Pat. Hey, thanks for having us on. Appreciate it. Don't forget, Diesel fans, if you want to be able to talk with us, chat with our guests, other truck enthusiasts, other fans of the Diesel podcast, make sure and join our Discord. We're going to have a link in the description. I look forward to seeing you there, being able to chat with you, learn about your trucks, the things you guys have going on. We're also going to have our Patreon link as well. So if you'd like to support the podcast, get some exclusive perks, help us keep doing what we're doing. We, we can't wait to see you on there and uh, be able to see some really cool truck covers with, you know, the trucks you guys are working on out there, bring you some exclusive episodes nobody's going to hear anywhere else, and also be able to get them out to you quicker before people on podcast apps and YouTube. 
Until next time, keep the shiny side up.